It's the two o'clock block on a Wednesday at ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. And we're talking to uh, Diane uh, Chadwick, and she is uh, with the Hawaii Community Foundation. She joins us by telephone from the Big Island, uh, from Hilo, I think. Yeah. Welcome to the show, oh, Diane. I'm, <laughs> Was I I'm actually in Waimea. Okay, Waimea. Okay, that's even better. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're here to talk about the uh, the the volcano, the volcano victims uh, relief fund. And uh, you've been administering that fund for a year now, yeah, since the volcano had its eruption uh, just about a year ago in, in May of uh, 2018. So we are very interested in talking to you about the fund and how it operates. Uh, first, can you tell us, you're, you're, the, you're the director of um, emergency relief. What is your title at HCF? No, I, I'm actually the director of community philanthropy on Hawaii Island. Ah, okay. And I'm the team leader for our, our staff on this island. Okay. And you operate out of Waimea in the Big Island? I do. We have two offices on Hawaii Island, one in Waimea and one in Hilo. We also have offices on Maui, Kauai, and of course our main office in Honolulu. Yeah, we're everywhere. The community fund is everywhere. So this has really been... Are, a, it, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, the joys of remote connection. <laughs> So uh, the community right. fund is everywhere, and uh, the community fund, you know, really jumped into the uh, the eruption and all the damage and dislocation that that involved, um, and and created um, a special fund um, just for the Big Island, just for the eruption, and you were administering that. That's the Hawaii Island Volcano Recovery Fund. I hope you don't have too much business going forward. Um, anyway, can you describe what happened and how the Hawaii Community Foundation got involved and, and how you got involved in this effort? Well, it actually it all happened so quickly. On Friday, May 4th, um, I was actually at a meeting in Kona and we felt a 6.9 magnitude earthquake, just, you know, a very strong earthquake. And we heard on the news that homes were already being destroyed by lava in Leilani Estates. And people were being evacuated. That was Friday. On Sunday afternoon, I received a phone call from Brandy Menino of Hope Services. They had already pulled together a, a meeting of nonprofits and government agencies to um, respond to the evacuees. And they called Hawaii Community Foundation. They called me to see if we could set up a fund to help with the response effort. So, so what is it? The, what? the next... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, the next day, uh, on Monday, I went to a meeting in um, Hilo and um, then heard what was beginning to be organized. I went back and contacted several of our donors who immediately agreed to start the fund. So I wanted to thank those donors, Eric Anderson, Roger Beck, Darian and Darian G, Kate Bell, Tom Blackburn, and an anonymous donor from Jack's Fund. They um, all were willing to, to put money for... Um, starting up the fund, then, and that happened on that same day on Monday, then our team in Honolulu got the word out that the fund had been established and we began to receive contributions from all over the world. Um, and as we say, we, we did um, raise a million dollars from about, from over 600 different individuals, businesses, classrooms, clubs, um, and we want to say, say mahalo to every giver for supporting this effort. Mm. How do you do that? How do you raise money from all over the world? I mean, I was going to say that the Hawaii Community uh, you know, Foundation can uh, raise money like nobody else in the state because you have so much history with so many uh, funders. Um, and certainly well, this was natural for you to do this. But uh, how do you do that? How do you, when you, you step out the door in the morning, how do you raise a million dollars? Well, you know, it was really due to the effort of our communications team um, and the news. They uh, went on the news and they said, we have a uh, fund available and you know, it was in, you know, uh, newspapers and, and that news broadcasting of that volcano was all over. Yeah. You know, it went everywhere. Yeah, people yeah. were so interested. And we are a credible organization that people feel comfortable giving to. They can be assured that their contributions will be used wisely and carefully. And uh, they did. They just started giving. Okay. So now you have, you've raised a million dollars for a very you know, notable event and a, a, a compelling need. Um, and so now people are being dislocated. They're, 
they're in trouble. Um, you know, they, they may not have resources to get along outside their homes, which have been destroyed and the like. Uh, how do you, how do you, you know, organize the effort to help them? Well, you know, I, we did not actually organize the response effort. That was very much um, the result of the community itself. So as I say, Brandy Menino from Hope Services called me. She had gotten together with Sharon Perosa from the County Office on Housing. Catholic Charities was there. Um, a number of organizations, Neighborhood Place of Kuna, they were already meeting and organizing. They had actually done this previously when the Hurricane Ebel hit the Kuna area. So they were all used to working together in disaster response. They started, um, and they held meetings. I went to the first meeting Monday morning. There were meetings every week, and they, more and more people kept coming to the meetings from all kinds of, you know, businesses and churches and organizations that wanted to help. Um, and so I attended those meetings, and I listened to hear what was being done and what was, where were the needs. And what I learned from that was that all of those organizations were really overextended. They had one, you know, they had small staff in a place like Hilo. You only had a few people. And they were getting hundreds of requests um, for, for help. And so we realized that what we needed to do was really help those organizations to have the staffing that they needed so that they could re respond and, you know, do their work to distribute food and household goods. They um, helped people find new living arrangements. They provided counseling and financial assistance. So our job was really to listen to the community and hear what was needed and, and respond in a way that would help them to do their work. So you had to make decisions about what you heard and how to allocate, uh, you know, the funding you'd received. Um, so how do you do that? Was that just a, a judgment call? Is that a committee? How do you do that? Well, actually, it was um, talking with the community, asking them what they, you know, thought would be the most helpful. But we also had, um, I had strong support from our, um, our, our whole staff in Honolulu. Um, we had actually a regular call in with our um, executive leadership team. And so um, everybody joined in on the conversation to help make that decision about where was the best. You know, so many people were giving goods, um, were giving food, um, clothing, uh, household supplies. We didn't feel like we needed to be paying for those kinds of items. And we really are... Um, we're really set up to support the nonprofit sector in many ways, so it really made sense for us to to help those organizations to do the work that they do. Mm -hmm. Now you divided up your uh, your grants uh, to the nonprofits in three categories: uh, uh, response, recovery, and rebuilding. Uh, can you describe you know the differences and the similarities between those those three areas of uh, grant? Yes, and we really learned about this, this way of responding to disasters from um, other uh, community foundations who have responded to disasters and from experts from FEMA and HIEMA. Um, there were so many disaster experts that, that came to Hilo um, and helped us to understand how recovery takes place in a community. So the rapid relief and response phase is really for the immediate needs. It provides shelter, food, mental health support um, for urgent needs for the people who are displaced. So we gave about $179,000 to eight organizations as quickly as possible. Our very first grant was made to the Kuna Baptist Church, who arranged for discounted laundry services at a laundromat in Pahoa. Mm -hmm. And they gave out vouchers to people who, you know, people had to leave their homes with just their clothes on their back. And they had nowhere to clean their clothing out. So... The church uh, organized this laundry voucher system, and they asked us if we would help to support it. So that was one of our first grants. And another early grant in this response phase was to the food basket. They received quadruple the amount of food and supplies that they usually do, and they didn't have enough pans to, to handle that. So they needed um, extra people in the warehouse to package it up and um, an additional driver to get the supplies out into the community. And so that's the kind of thing that we supported was for them to be able to have the staffing to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, the second phase is the recovery phase. So with a volcanic eruption that went on for months, um, it wasn't like the disaster happened and it was over in a day. It just mm -hmm. kept happening. Yeah. But um, what 
and, and people began to realize that they were going to be in the shelters for a long time. Some of those families were trying to find other living arrangements. Um, and so the recovery uh, and stabilization phase is where we actually help to provide uh, legal aid services. Um, there was a lot of legal um, advice that was given regarding insurance claims. Habitat for Humanity um, began to, we provided funding for them to have um, two staff positions to begin to work with families and figure out about repairing and, or rebuilding homes if they were needed. Um, we also gave to Hawaiian Community Assets. They helped to provide financial counseling and loans for people who were trying to sort out their, their housing needs and in some cases having to replace, you know, cars and furniture and things like that. Um, then the third phase is rebuilding. This is after, you know, this is a longer term phase um, where the community is trying to rebuild itself. Um, given the loss of over 700 homes, we were looking at supporting some long-term affordable housing options. Um, and in this phase, we've given um, funding to um, Hawaii Alliance for Community-Based Economic Development. They were working together with the county who wanted to explore the option of having a um, affordable uh, housing land trust set up to try and help to provide some of the uh, housing options. Um, we also gave a grant to the Maku'u Farmers Association. They've had an event called Activate Kuna, which worked with, which um, really was helping to get the community back on its feet and engage the youth and the business community in Pahoa. Mm -hmm. How do you think the community is back? I mean, to what degree? Have you staved off, you know, was social and community disaster, and to what degree has the community recovered over the past year? Well, there are a lot of people who have been able to return to homes or are able to um, find new housing, but there are there are still many people who who are not able to. They're on incomes where they can't afford housing outside of that Puna area. Um, their homes were completely destroyed and they don't have any other means of building. In some cases, people had taken all of their savings, you know, their their savings or whatever, had built a house, and that was all that they had. And when mm -hmm. it was destroyed, they had nothing left. Yeah. So there are still people in that situation, and, um, there are, and, and organizations like Habitat for Humanity, Hawaii Island, are, uh, and Hawaiian Community Assets, Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, they're, um, they're all working to try and still help people who are the, those last people that really have no other option. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, hundreds of people lost their homes or other, you know, critical property like cars. And, um, you know, it seems to me that um, it, this is sort of a, um, a, a, good, a good example of the, of the need and the success of having uh, HCF uh, agents, uh, executives, management people on all the islands because uh, you had to deal with other organizations on the Big Island. You had to deal with really the entire community on the Big Island and your knowledge of them, your relationships with them undoubtedly helped you in making the right choices and making the most uh, efficient use of the money. Am I right about that? Oh, yes, and that, that's why Hawaii Community Foundation has um, offices on the neighbor islands. We really feel that it's important to, to know the communities and to be a part of them so that um, when, you know, we're working in the community, we can actually, um, we have a lot of relationships, and we draw, we really work together um, with our donors and with the business, government, and uh, nonprofit sector to come up with solutions. Yeah, it strikes me that... Um you know, you had to be working with, um, you know, other nonprofits, uh, other funding organizations that were uh, like-minded and trying to help. Um, and so it was important that you knew who they were um, so as not to, you know, duplicate efforts and coordinate things. And um, we, we'll, we'll talk more about who was involved, but I, I would imagine that your relationships with these other organizations, including religious and other charitable organizations, is very helpful, and uh, it, it uh, you know it made made the whole effort collaborative. Am I right? Yes, indeed. And I think the other thing is that well, because we know those organizations, it was easy to turn around and give them a grant very quickly. We knew that you know we knew they were credible. We knew they were doing the work, 
uh, you know, we were on the ground. We could see that they were working with people. So I, that knowledge helped us to be able to distribute the money very quickly. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, uh, Diane. We'll take a one-minute break, and we'll come back. And at that time, we can show some of the photographs that you have of the efforts on the ground. Uh, this is Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Diane Chadwick of HCF on the Big Island. Uh, we're talking about the v Volcano uh, Eruption Relief Fund. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Daylan Yanagita, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and on the phone from uh, the, the Big Island is uh, Diane Chadwick of HCF, who has been managing a, a recovery fund for the, uh, the losses uh, resulting from last year's uh, some, uh, eruption in the Big Island. So we have some photos. Let me describe them to you, Diane, and you can give us uh, the background of the photos. Uh, the first photo is a photo of some, some, some fellows uh, putting food and there's a truck next to it says food basket. Uh, they're putting uh, uh, some food in a, in, a, in, a, in a truck. What does that signify? What's, what's happening in that photo? Right. I, I mentioned earlier that the food basket immediately started to have contributions from just everywhere. They had containers that were being shipped in from other islands, from other states. They had so many supplies that they had to sort through and then truck it out to the Puna community. So that's what that picture is showing that one of the drivers, I believe, and the warehouse workers. Okay. The next one, the next photograph we're going to show you is a, it's a lot of people in a room. Oh, it looks like dozens of people around a huge big table in a, looks like a government room to me, but it's a really big conference room. And they're all intent on discussing things. And I'm, I'm sure you are at that table, aren't you? Yes, this, this was a government room. We were all meeting at the Office of Housing. And um, that group kept growing and growing. That was one of the things that astounded me the most, is how many people came forward and met week after week, um, sharing what they were doing and what was needed and what was happening. It was a, and eventually that group, and that was made up of um, nonprofits, business people, the government agencies. Um, uh, there was a faith hui of churches. A number of a lot of churches came to the table, and um, eventually, um, with the advice of FEMA, that group uh, formalized and became known as Hawaii Island Disaster Response and Recovery Team. Um, the acronym is HIDART. Mm -hmm. uh, gee, um, okay, and that and that's very important because uh, then that that group might be around or will be around presumably the next time anything like this happens. So you learned a lot. Uh, about how to organize a group like this and make it work. And furthermore, it seems to me um, that you as HCF really have to be there and you have to see the dynamic of it and you have to be able to communicate with the individuals who are at the table. You couldn't function without being in touch with all of them. So this is a very good social experience, but it's also a learning experience for the future. Am I right? Oh, yes. This group has already uh, been planning um, for how they will mobilize again more quickly or just as quickly and uh, more efficiently for the next disaster. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next, uh, the next photo. Um, okay, this is a person. I don't think it's you, but it's a person, a young person, uh, with two dogs, a big dog and maybe a smaller dog. And it 
Looks like this person is in temporary housing. Uh, this is part of your effort to provide housing, am I right? Well, this is actually a photo taken at the, the Pahoa shelter. So the Pahoa shelter, it had hundreds of people, and this was a, a, a gym at the Pahoa Park. And so the gymnasium itself could not hold all of the people who needed shelter. And there were camps set up all around the shelter. And that is one of the, res one of the people who was staying at the camp. And there were animals. There were animals all over the place. I remember seeing a duck and some other kind. There was just a lot of different people there with their pets and, you know, waiting for the to stop. Yeah. So they could go back to their home. Yeah, your pets are very important to you in times of need, and it's very tragic yes. if you lose them or somehow they're injured by what has happened. So saving the pets is uh, very important to saving the family. Let's look at the next picture. Okay, now, now here it looks like some tents. Uh, looks like a tent of maybe 15 by 15 by mm, 6 or 8 feet. Um, and it looks yep. like a, a small house. What is this? And it's in a parking lot, number of them in a parking lot. What is yep, that? Yeah, this, that's just at the Pahoa shelter. So there were, uh, you know, tents all around in the parking lot and then all the, play the playing fields all around outside of the gymnasium. Okay, uh, let's go to the next and last photo we have. And this is a, an emotional scene of a man and a woman in, um, in the red, red shirts, if you recall, and they're, they're under a shelter in a parking lot and they're obviously concerned and passionate about something. What is it? This, this is actually members of the Puna Baptist Church. Um, a lot of church members help um, families to evacuate from their homes. A lot of churches came together and took, you know, trucks out there and helped people move. Um, they also provided, you know, counseling and prayer for, for families that were in the shelters. This particular photo is of the Puna Baptist Church members who um, were distributing laundry vouchers so that people could take those vouchers to the laundromat down the street and um, wash their clothing. And a grant was made to the, the church to help pay for those vouchers. Mm, it's a small thing, but you really feel a lot better in clean clothes. Well, you know, I, I have to say that uh, this, was, this was quite an effort, and it's, it strikes me that as far as the Big Island is concerned, uh, what happened in Pune, what happened with this uh, volcanic eruption, uh, and all the lava that flowed through residential communities is unprecedented. I mean, in, in all of history that we know about. But I also suggest that it's, this is this effort that you were undertaking uh, on behalf of HCF and its various uh, granting individuals and agencies, uh, also unprecedented, an experience you never had before. Am I right? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, I just had to jump in and figure out what was going on really quickly. Yeah, one of the things uh, I meant to ask you about was the Streak, S-T-R-E-A-K, database and how it played in identifying what, uh, well, either side of the equation, the grantors or the beneficiaries. What does Streak stand for? What is it? Well, you know, I don't know what it stands for, but it's actually a, um, a database that will keep track of... Um, it, was, it was used to track the requests for assistance. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the organizations, the service organizations who responded immediately, they had uh, worked together um, for the Hurricane Zell response. And they knew that people who were in distress from the disaster didn't need to be trying to find the social service agencies who could help them. And so the social service agencies actually set up a resource center at the Pohoa shelter. And people from Catholic Charities, from Child and Family Service, from Hope Services, from the Food Basket, all these different organizations came to the Resource Center. And um, they agreed to all work together to have one central intake of requests for assistance. So the street database was used. People would fill out a simple form saying what they needed help with. Did they need help with housing? Did they need financial assistance? Did they need clothing? Did they, and actually, did they want to, to leave the island? And so um, all of these requests were then entered into the central database, and then they were referred out to the appropriate organization. So, for example, Child and Family Services was um, helping people to get airfares to fly if they had family outside of Hawaii and they just wanted to leave the area. Um, they could 
be connected to Child and Family Service, and they would tell Family Service would then call them up and help them to, you know, resolve that issue. Or if they needed a housing support, Hope Services would call them and help them to figure out how to find alternative housing arrangements. So the centralized database was really important so that people, you know, the, the evacuees didn't have to go looking for the help, and they didn't have to, to work with a lot of different agencies if the agencies were directly connected to them. Yeah. The other thing benefit the, the street database was that the county didn't, you know, they were actually busy working on getting people out of the area. They were not and directly um, involved with the, the service that was being given to people. So when it came time to be able to tell the federal government the extent of how many people were being impacted, um, this database was very helpful to tell them that there were over 1,200 requests for help, um, and they were able to use those numbers as they were talk, you know, letting the emergency agencies know of the extent of the disaster mm -hmm. effect. What strikes me is that you're describing a picture where, you know, with, through others and people you're collaborating with, you are dealing with individual uh, problems, individual mm, situations, and you're helping individuals, uh, which is, that's, right. that's remarkable, and I think it's made possible by something like the Streak Database. Um, and, I, and I wonder how all of that, you know, that, you would not expect, for example, state government or federal government to deal on such an individual level that way. And I wonder what their role was while you were working on, you know, on your uh, vol volcano relief fund. Uh, what what uh, FEMA was doing and what the state government was doing, um, you know, to to deal with this, um, you know, uh, this uh, volcanic eruption. Well, in in the beginning, the state and federal FEMA and HIEMA, um, were they came over to Hilo right away. They were at the table almost from day one. And um, FEMA, I believe, has to wait for a certain period of time. It has to be declared, and then they, they have a lot of, you know, procedures. So it was weeks before FEMA was able to actually come in. They were there, and they were giving advice, very good advice, but they were not able to open up their resource center to access their, you know, the funds from FEMA a number of weeks. So um, when they did finally um, were able to open the resource center and begin to process applications for, you know, FEMA help relief, um, then the local resource center was able to close down. But FEMA did work closely with the local organizations, and a lot of the local volunteers um, were there at the FEMA resource center and helped to um, guide the, the um people who needed help around the resource center and, and connect them into the FEMA dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me go to two uh, last things because we're almost out of time. And, um, you know, one of them is, uh, how, how, you know, you raised a million dollars over, over time, and that is something. And uh, then you, you made a lot of grants to a lot of people and situations to try to, um, you know, improve life for them in the, in the stress of all this. Um, are you done? Uh, have you spent it all? Um, if you're not done, when will the job be done? And also, uh, are you still taking requests for grants? Are you still taking money uh, for the fund? What's the status right now, Diane? Well, right now we um, we we have we have spent out nine hundred thousand dollars of the money that was raised. We do have some money left. We are still talking with. Um, organizations that are looking at that long-term recovery. We just recently made grants for the Community uh, Affordable Land Trust um, and for um, more work to be done by the um, Hawaiian Community Assets. Uh, Hawaiian yeah, Community Assets um, is continuing to provide financial counseling and loans. There's a group called the Kilauea Hui, which is made up of Salvation Army Catholic Charities, um, uh, let's see, Hawaiian Community Assets, Habitat for Humanity, they actually are, are still getting together and reviewing individual cases and um, pooling the resources that they have gotten from us and other, other sources um, to continue to try and, you know, uh, help people with their housing situations. Um, so there, there is still work going on. We are trying to um, wrap up the fund. Of, Hopefully, over the next month or two, um, we will send it out. 
we are not, you know, we're not looking for applications. We, there, there was not an application process for this, but we are keeping our ears open to hear what else is needed for that last bit of money. Mm -hmm. um, we are not looking for additional contributions to the fund. Our, uh, my suggestion, our suggestion is that um, they, if people want to help, to give it directly to those organizations that are doing the work. So mm -hmm. as I've mentioned, mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity, Catholic Charities, um, Hawaiian Community Assets, all of those folks who are still serving people, folk services. So we say, um, and our, we have a list on our website of all of the grantees at hawaiicommunityfoundation.org slash volcano recovery. If you look at that list, um, we suggest that you, uh, you know, connect up with those organizations directly and contribute to them. Well, Diane Chadwick, Hawaii Community Foundation on the Big Island, managed this huge effort over the past year. Good for you, Diane. Thank you for joining us on the show and talking about it. We really appreciate it on both levels, on your, on your efforts and on your discussion with us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting um, me to speak about this. This is important. It was really a huge community effort. We learned a lot from it, and um, we really you know, hope that everybody will be resettled and back to their lives after this disaster. Yeah. This is part of sustainability in Hawaii, part of resilience in Hawaii, and you are definitely part of it. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you very much, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.